This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Eric Goldstein is an ANS Life Fellow and the Senior Curator of Mechanical Arts, Metals, and Numismatics at uh, Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Uh, he originally hails from New York City uh, and is a lifelong student of numismatics, arms, militaria, and material culture of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, he has about 12 years uh, as a professional numismatist uh, and consultant under his belt. Uh, he is a regular speaker at numismatic conferences across the United States, uh, an author of dozens of journal articles on varied subjects. Notably, he has authored six books related to antique weaponry and military history and has won awards across the board. Today, Eric will be doing a live demonstration for us uh, on the style of minting presses used by the uh, Massachusetts Bay Mint in the late 17th century. Uh, while this does slightly predate our date range of 17th and 18th or 18th and 19th century design and production, uh, these types of presses were used into the early 18th century. Uh, so there is some overlap. Uh, and also kind of, I wanted to use this as a first demonstration on like um, what people were using as the uh, 18th and 19th centuries uh, began. So please, without further ado, Eric Goldstein, thank you. Oh, thank you. Is it possible to go to PowerPoint, please? Oh, this is a remote control. Is this a remote control? For, yes. So I can advance slides with this. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Is every, Good morning. everybody sufficiently caffeinated? <laughs> uh, I wake up full of energy and then I add caffeine to that. So I'm sorry if I speak too fast or seem a little excited, but uh, I'm a little excited. And uh, kind of a little bit passionate about numismatics, especially uh, what we're about to talk about today, which is sort of a, a convergence of a number of different things I do at Colonial Williamsburg. It's numismatics and it's mechanical arts. So I have a few PowerPoint slides that will help me jump into the subject. But while they're coming up, uh, I'll tell you how this project started. Basically, it was a gentleman's disagreement between Chris Salmon and I about the nature of the coin press that was used in Massachusetts after the mid 1650s to strike the oak tree and then the large planch at pine tree shillings. Um, he said rocker, I said roller. It was a little bit like that 80s beer campaign, less filling, tastes great. Um, what we didn't know at the time is that we were basically talking about the same machine. Uh, they operate in exactly the same way. And really they're is a minor difference, which uh, I'll be able to show you in a couple of minutes. But um, it was a case of, Eric, put your money where your mouth is. Now, I'm probably the only person in this room who has really good friends who are very finely skilled blacksmiths in the historic style. Anybody else have blacksmith friends? They're great people. They drink a lot of beer, great bunch of guys. But uh, I went to our blacksmiths at Colonial Williamsburg and said, hey, can you build a 17th century coin press that looks like this? And they said, yeah. So I figured, all right, we're going to embark on a program of what we museum dorks call experimental archaeology, where we use the materials that were correct to the period and the techniques and uh, try to recreate what was created in these historic periods uh, to the best of our ability. So by recreating an eight, uh, 17th century coin press, we could start to understand some of the idiosyncrasies that we modern numismatists see in 17th century coinage at large, and specifically the products of the Massachusetts Bay Mint. So we are almost there. Um, I do not intend to lecture today. This is supposed to be a demonstration and a conversation. So if I'm going too fast or I gloss over something you want some more information about, please just stop me and ask your question. So are there any questions yet? Oh, oh that was it.
Do I aim at the computer? Okay. Okay, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll, I'll speak from over here. Is this, will this work until I get to the machine? Okay, so what's the first step in recreating a 17th century coin press? Well, you basically, you have to look at original surviving examples, two of which are on screen here. Do we have, we do have a laser pointer. We have the roller press and the rocker press. Anybody see the obvious difference between the two? Gears, yeah. A roller press has gears that have a teeth cut, a full 360 around their circumference. A rocker press has it cut for about 180 degrees or half the circumference of the wheel. It's next to nothing. It affects in no way, shape, or form the way the machine operates. Um, you have two set screws to apply the pressure to the machine. And you have a crank and you have a, a simple thing that is uh, really akin to a pasta roller, a laundry wringer, uh, those machines that squish souvenir pennies at state fairs and things like that. There's really not much to this machine. And whether or not it's geared 360 around or half the way around, it, it just doesn't matter. So the rocker press and the roller press as I see it, are the same thing. And I've kind of stopped using both terms. Um, I don't know if this is technically correct. I have an engineer son who says it's not correct, but I call it a biaxial press. It's a coin press that uses opposing axles or axes to sort of apply pressure from the top and the bottom and press out a coin. And I technically probably shouldn't say strike because we're not talking about something that's percussive. We're talking about coin designs being imparted into the planchet more or less in a straight line at a, at a time as it progresses from the top of the planchet down. So it's a very gentle sort of way of striking coins or pressing coins. Now, uh, there is some precedent to a mechanism of this sort, and I know it's caused some confusion in numismatic circles because in the period, uh, this would be referred to as a mill. And it's, it's been believed that there were no rolling mills in America until the late 18th century. You know, Paul Revere famously had a copper rolling mill operating in Massachusetts in the tail end of the 18th century. And that's kind of true, but that's a water powered industrial scale rolling mill. Uh, small scale rolling mills akin to our machine here. What is that the, you know what, let me go this way were very commonly part of the arsenal of a silversmith. And we know that Holland Sanderson got the commission to produce these coins because they were silversmiths. Uh, on screen at left is a typical silversmith's mill that produces, um, well, what silver people would refer to as a milled banding. Uh, it's basically a strip of metal with a design struck or pressed into one side of the piece that becomes an ornamental border that is then attached to the body of whatever piece the silversmith is working on. And right here is a tankard by our friend Robert Sanderson. And if you look right here, that's a milled banding. That's proof right there that they had one of these machines. Now, the interesting thing about this machine it's a biaxial press. And what happens if you swap out those rollers for a flat axle with a square mortise in it that a coin die can sit in? You now have a coin press. It's a very simple conversion to a very simple machine. So um, does this make sense to everybody? I think in the past, as numismatists who are looking at steam presses, hydraulic presses, screw presses, they're all fairly complicated machines. This is not. And in fact, um, oh, I just got a zoom invite I don't want. Ah. <laughs> all right, let me see where I'm going next. Okay, am I in control? Okay. 
anyway, let me go back to this one. So if I had to come up with um, one word to describe the nature of this machine is it would be slop. When we think of machines, we think of tight tolerances, we think of finely toothed gears, we think of precision. Precision is the enemy of this machine's functionality. You want that give, you want that slop, uh, or else the machine is not going to work. And it is that slop that causes some of the charming, wonderful things that we can observe in oak and pine tree shillings. So uh, this is the machine right here. The very machine over there, that's me fighting with it because uh, it can be a bit picky. Um, but this is what we came up with based on the originals that we have photographs of from various uh, mint museums in Europe. So uh, quite a few of these still exist in Europe. Uh, none exist here as far as I know. So do you know why we call her Miss Betsy? Has anybody read uh, Tales from Grandfather's Chair? published by Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1841. It's a wonderful book that he produced to teach early American history to his grandkids. And he's sitting in this beat up old chair and he's telling them stories of the historical events that this chair witnessed. Now, as it turns out, the chair was once the governor's chair of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and it was broken. And it was purchased and repaired by none other than our John Hull grandfather sitting in this very chair. Now, John Hull, according to Hawthorne, um, grew rich for producing pine tree shillings. And I think this tale is probably why pine tree shillings are so near and dear to uh, the hearts of American uh, numismatics and numismatists. But the story goes that uh, Hull had a rather beyond Rubenesque daughter, to be politically correct. And she was courted by none other than Samuel Sewell, who was a, a big up and coming mucky muck in Boston society, and who later became famous for being one of the uh, judges at the Salem witchcraft trials. And it is true that Samuel Sewell did marry the daughter of John Hull, but uh, Hawthorne didn't know what uh, Hull's daughter's name was. Uh, so he called her Betsy. So we named the machine after her. That's why she's Miss Betsy. Uh, her real name was Hannah, by the way. And uh, the, the charming part of the story is when Sewell married Hull's daughter, the real Hannah Hull, um, he paid her marriage dowry with her weight in pine tree shillings, fresh from the mint. It's a great story. I, you can look it up. Uh, I, I highly recommend reading it. But uh, this is a project that, that really was meant to be fun. And I've learned a lot of things about the machine. Um, let's see where we are. So the coins that we decided to produce, uh, we don't want to be accused of being counterfeiters. We're not counterfeiting anything. So I basically took a large planchet pine tree shillings design um, instead of Massachusetts in New England and Dom um, 1652 over the denomination of 12. Uh, we went with Williamsburg in Virginia and Dom 1699 for the date of the founding of Williamsburg. And instead of a very New England pine tree, we went with a Southern loblolly because these don't grow in New England. So essentially we're, we're coming up with a coin design that is using the same vocabulary of the Massachusetts Bay Mint, but we're substituting something that's distinctive to Williamsburg and Virginia. And we're creating something that never existed historically. So we're kind of in the clear, right? Um, not to mention, uh, I'm striking it on scrap copper that's left over from the upholstery conservation lab. So it's a, it's a fun way of recycling. I'm basically mutilating garbage to make these coins. But, um, well, no, more. So uh, there are some things that I learned about the dyes. Who would assume that the dye faces at the Massachusetts Bay Mint were hardened steel? You might, they don't need to be. They're striking, excuse me, they're pressing under pressure. There's no concussive strike. And in fact, when you think about it, think about the die that started out as the oak tree 13 
that ended up as the oak tree 14, the spiny oak, that die went through so many reworkings that it just doesn't make sense, metallurgically speaking, to have to anneal and reharden the surface of that die every single time you wanted to touch up a detail. And I can tell you, having worked quite a bit with iron and steel, you can't do it because the heat necessary to do this is gonna cause spalling, loss of detail, it doesn't make sense. What I can tell you about these, which have mild steel faces, is that, oh, when something is starting to wear, and I have a, a pair of dies here that did start to wear, if it's left in the soft, you can just re-engrave it as you see fit, which is why we have the 13.3 and the 13.6 and the 13.9 oak tree shillings, <clears throat> because they touched it up as they needed it. As far as the shape of the dies, um, the two examples up on the screen show whatever coins, but if you look at the the Noe 5 oak tree, you'll see part of the top of the die here. And on this piece, you'll see part or, or you know, uh, the perimeter of the die down here. This suggests the die was round, and this suggests the die was kind of squarish. So I experimented with both types of dies or both shapes uh, for the fields outside of the live area of the piece. And you see how ragged this is? I don't think that's chipping. And the reason I don't think that's chipping is because this punched beaded border, it takes a dip right below that. I just think that was a rough edge of the die. Huh, rough edge of the die. You gotta remember, Hull and Sanderson were not creating arts. This was industrial production and their pay was a proportion of their output. Time is money, folks. These coins didn't need to be beautiful. And I don't think anybody is going to stand here and tell me an oak tree five is a pretty coin. It ain't art, people. So, again, some of the things that we've learned with this. Okay. What do I have next? Uh, this is, you know, basically the cross section of the die. It's kind of a, uh, a square top mushroom. Very, very simple. Uh, I've got uh, this set of dies um, up on the table over here, which you are welcome to come up to and uh, play with a little bit later. Before I go any further, do we have any questions at this point? Am I making sense? Yeah? Sir? Oh, no, no, steel, but they weren't hardened. So basically to harden steel, to heat treat it, you have to get it super, super hot, not necessarily glowing, but well north of seven or 800 degrees, and then you quench it. And when that happens, you know, iron or steel, they're very dirty metals. They create oxides, impurities rise to the surface, and that's gonna ruin anything that was previously engraved in the die phase. Then again, because you've got a hardened surface, if you've got a spall problem or a rust problem, and you wanna clean and re-engrave your dies, you can't engrave a hardened surface. You then have to anneal it where you get it just as hot and then you let the metal air cool slowly. And you go through the whole process again because you've got the oxides, the impurities rising to the surface. So heat treating is your enemy and it's completely unnecessary for a setup like this. And that's one of the beauties of the simplicity of this sort of coin press. Is that an adequate explanation? Ah, good, thank you. Did I do that? Okay. Plancha texture. Now, this is a coin that I think came out of a VF30 holder, and uh, it was in Krolovich's inventory, and I couldn't wait to buy it. Who in this room would buy this coin as a VF oak tree shilling and be happy with it? It's not. It depends on the. Well, yeah. <laughs> It wasn't cheap. Well, I mean, you know, it was cheap, but this is this is essentially half of a coin on a full planchet. But what it is to me is an amazing document because right here, this unstruck area, and this unstruck area right here, those show me the texture of what a, a blank Massachusetts mint planchet looked like. And what do we have? We have the striations. Did I do that? I didn't mean to do that. The striations. What's going on? We have a bouncing uh, arrow. 
That is not me. Um, these striations show that the stock was rolled and that, again, they weren't too picky about what the surface of the planchets look like because you know what? It doesn't matter. And the proof of the pudding is right up in the struck areas. All those striations go away, but this is a really good document because we're never going to find a blank Massachusetts Bay mint planchet. Another interesting thing. I think all of this stuff is interesting, so I'm sorry if I keep repeating that. Um, how are the planchets made? I've tried everything under the sun, and some things work, some things don't work. Uh, from what I can tell you, um, I think it was fairly straightforward. Uh, silver is coming into the Massachusetts Mint. It's being melted down. <clears throat> It's being cast into ingots or heavy strip billets. Those are then hammered much flatter and longer. And then eventually when they're the proper thickness, they're cut into strips and they're put through a roller, <clears throat> which could be the same machine as Miss Betsy, except with two 360 rollers to sort of flatten the metal to a uniform thickness. <clears throat> and then you need to cut them out. Really, the only way to cut them out is with a shear either a bench mounted shear like I'm using in this photograph or handheld shears, they're not really conducive to cutting curves, but you can take a lot of little straight snips to get around. And what I believe they were doing to cut the planchets were, these guys were good. They were making thousands of coins. Like a jeweler's eye, you could gauge the thickness of a metal just by looking at it. I can, I can tell you but 16 gauge from 19 gauge sheet metal just because I've worked with it in the production of these coins, they could do the same. They knew for a particular thickness of a metal, ah, I need an oval of about this shape. So I believe they were cutting out about that shape, which is gonna get them pretty close to the, say 72 grain target they need to be at. But then you have a problem, you're not really ready to go because shears leave a pretty serious bird edge. And in fact, I'm gonna warn you when you play with some of the, uh, the blanks later, uh, there might be a bird edge and a bird edge will, B-U-R-R-E-D, will cut your finger. You don't see bird edges on these pieces. So what I believe they were doing, they're getting them rough cut, they're close to the weight, maybe they're 75 grains, maybe they're 80 grains. Um, I believe they were then put in a tumbler and a tumbler is, a hamster wheel, a closed hamster wheel filled with gravel. And the beauty of a tumbler is you can throw in your planchets, you can tumble it for an hour or so, you'll pull out your completely deburred, cleaned up planchets, and at the same time, it's a captive system, so you can throw the gravel onto a fire and recapture the silver, microscopic silver particles that are being shaved off. I think then at that point, the planchets were weighed, they were adjusted again with a similar set of shears, and some minor cutting to get them into the right ballpark, then they were struck. So when you look at these coins, you see all these very irregular faceted edges, but you don't see the burrs. You have a question? Yes. Wouldn't it be faster to do it like a cookie cutter with a machine that would punch it, out a bunch a, of A blanking press, yeah. yeah did I, you try that? No, because they, I, I don't see any evidence that any of the large planchet issues were struck on a blanking, on planchets prepared with a blanking press. The small planchets certainly were because there are some small planchet pine trees that you'll see that show a, a miscut. It gives like a, like a semicircular scar near the edge of the coin. So um, every pine tree, large planchet or oak tree shelling I've seen is on its own hand cut planchet. And if you look at the European woodcuts of the period, the engravings, you see guys doing exactly what I'm doing there. So this is what I believe they did. And it's pretty close to what I've been doing to sort of make good sample coins here. Um, and I think, is that my last slide? How am I doing for time? Uh, 9.56? 9.56? Perfect, so I wanted to end this section at 10 o'clock so we could then uh, switch over to the real action over here. And another interesting example I want to put up, which may help uh, explain my point to you, Chris. Two 
um, Noe 5 pine trees, look at the same, same dyes. Look at the different shapes of the planchet. I mean, the one on the right is fairly unusual being horizontal and being that, you know, this machine presses things tall to get something that horizontal. This must have been a really wackadoodle shaped planchet when it went in. But you know what? It didn't matter. All right. Um, let's go over to the machine. All right, uh, you know, uh, picking on that oak tree five, and the reason I like, you know, the oak tree Noe five is because you have very obviously misaligned dyes. You know, the obverse is always centered south. You get a little bit of uh, unstruck material at the extreme top that represents not just unstruck planchet, but stuff that's over the edge of the obverse dye. And that illustrates my slop point because if you look at the gears on, on the press, you might think, oh, well, why couldn't they just adjust that obverse die, you know, one notch up? These dies need to be so coarse and heavy that you really can't do that. But where you do have some latitude, right here, if you want to come around and if I do this, there's lots of wiggle room in here. I can pull these out at will. In fact, if this was uh, created to such tight tolerances, you'd really be hamstrung. The machine wouldn't work. So we want all that play. And I would suggest that the reason the obverse of the oak tree five in most cases is off center to the south is because the shim stock that they were using between the square shank and the hole in the axle was just not properly aligned. And with that slop in there, you have the ability to adjust both dies in either of the four cardinal directions. It's an ingenious system. It's, it's, it's perfect for this sort of coinage. Um, okay, well, let's try it. Um, these things are finicky. This sets... If I loosen these all the way up, these set pressure. This doesn't move, but look what happens now when I, since I loosened it. And let's get some scrap copper here. See, I save little pieces like this because they help me test the pressure and they help me test whether the pressure is even left to right. So if I tried to feed in a piece of copper now, Nothing. Okay. So I'm going to spitball it and do this. Let's see how it's feeling. And I, you can, oh, still not enough pressure. Uh, it's a little bit of pressure. Let's see what it happens. You know, not even close. Probably didn't make a mark. Nope. Nothing. Let's go down a little bit more. Okay, now it's starting to bite. I can feel it. The dies firm up and they, they're not moving. I want to keep my little strip more or less on center. And let's see what we get. I wasn't sweating. I wasn't working. Not enough pressure. Did we get anything? Uh, yeah, we got a little. Can you see any of that? No? That's unacceptable. Okay. Let's give it another quarter turn. I think we're getting in. Oh, yeah, we're getting in the right ballpark here. Now I'm going to be working. Okay. Okay. We're getting a reasonable amount of pressure. You see how one side <clears throat> is much longer, more distorted than the other side? This started out as a perfect rectangle. 
And now look at it. What that tells me is that this side has more pressure on it than this side. Well, that doesn't have nearly enough pressure, so I want to tighten this down a little bit. Okay? And that's garbage. I think we're getting close here. Let's try again. Let's compare. Better, but still not enough pressure. So I'm going to put a little more pressure there, and I'm going to back this one off a little bit. Now we're getting to the fine tuning here. All right. Oh, getting close. Almost. Tighten that a little more. close, but I'm starting to work a little hard. And look at that, we're starting to see a curve in the planchet. So I'm going to loosen this one a little bit, because you don't want to have to fight with it too much. Okay. Almost there. Let's give this a little twelfth of a turn, as we'll call it. I'm thinking this is going to be the last one. Okay, we're in business. So, a couple of little scraps. If I was John Hull, I would take these scraps that I just used to align my dies. They'd go right back into the crucible. So let's, let's grab a couple of spitballed planchets, as I would call them, close to the right weight, but not finally adjusted. And I have to give you a disclaimer. I didn't weigh any of these planchets. I just didn't have the time, and I didn't think you guys would care because they're going to be free, right? <laughs> so, okay. Let's see what we can do here. This part's a little tricky. You want to make sure you get the bite. As the dies converge, you want to get the bite on the right spot on that planchet. You want it lined up. And you want it to be bit firm because you're about to apply quite a bit of force and you want to make sure it's it's going to feed properly. It's pretty easy to strike coins that are drastically off center on this thing. And that is not a good thing for you error collectors out there. So no offense. All right. Let's see what we got here. Stuck to the dies a little bit. There's the first one. I didn't feed it properly. It's a little bit too centered to the bottom. And it's also a little bit too distorted. At the bottom, you see it gets real thin over here. But we're starting to see that, uh, that S curve. Incidentally, that S curve, you can control it. In many cases, you know, where, where you see the same coin, that has a greater S curve than another example of the same coin. It all has to do with how much pressure the machine is set for. And another thing uh, that I think, until I get one that's really, I'm gonna put a little more pressure on it. Let's cause, let's cause a little more curvature. And I'm gonna go to a, uh, an octagonal blank, which is kind of like a souvenir sheet thing. Oh, this one came out pretty good. She's being finicky today. I want her to curve coins, so let's try it again. Must be the humidity in here. For lack of.
Can you see the waviness? It always curves down at the bottom and it curves. I don't know if it's going to pick up on this. Can you see that? You can. Okay. Um, some of the ones I struck yesterday were really curved and it's not curving today. Well, let's try one more here. I can't do it. You know what that means? Oh no, too much pressure. Partial strike. I'm just gonna feed it in the other way. Not enough pressure. I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to start over again with checking my pressure and alignment. See what I mean by this thing is fussy? Nope, not good. Keep biting. Off center. Could use a little bit more pressure though. Okay. Are there any questions while I'm doing this? Yeah. yeah when the coins come off of the press, are they when when the coins come off of the press, are they hot like struck coins? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course they're hot, but is their temperature elevated? I don't know. Not really. Okay. No. The struck coins are come off hot. This is such a good way to produce coins. It's unbelievable. Do you see how easy this is? You see, if you mechanize this where this week we're melting silver and processing it into strip, this week we are cutting planchets, the next week we're striking coins. You can see how they have an output of thousands of coins in a shot. Yeah, second question. Um, so when the dies were cut, were they rounded to begin with, or did they cut them straight and then apply some process to curve them? Here, I'll show you. Um, this is the failed set of dies, and there's, there's actually a sweet spot in this mechanism in that if you think of the curved surface of the die as an arc of a circle, that complete circle, whatever the diameter of it is, matches one for one the diameter of the gears. And once I figured that out, I was like, aha. So I made a gauge of exactly that arc. So the next time the blacksmiths are going to forge me up some dies, I've got this tool to sort of basically smooth that surface. I don't do this on a machine. I do this with, uh, you know, the tools they would have had. I basically use a file and then, uh, you know, coarse abrasives and, you know, get it somewhat fine. But if you look at the, the fields on pine tree and, and oak tree shillings, they're not that smooth. They're not that polished. Uh, some of the polish that you see here happens during the course of using the die to strike, excuse me, press pieces. So what I would do is uh, after I got the surface the way I wanted it, curved, um, I draw an X corner to corner, I find my center point, I hit it with a center punch, which you do see raised center punches on many, many pine tree and oak tree shillings. Uh, then I take uh, a compass and I scribe in 
two concentric circles that represent where the beaded borders are gonna go. And the beaded borders are literally nothing more than a punch where you just go in and you go dot, 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 dot. And then I pull out my graver and I am not a good engraver, but yet I can mimic what Hull and Sanderson were doing. <laughs> you know, it didn't take much and it's fairly simple. So uh, uh, come up later and make sure you take a look at this die. Does that answer that question? Oh, sir. Um, do you have a sense of, of how often, uh, say, how many coins could be produced before you would have to readjust the pressures and continue to, to mess around with that? <laughs> Frequently. Uh, it's one of the things that I've learned because, you know, when I've demonstrated this before, like uh, you saw pictures of me in 18th century attire, those were for uh, workshops we've had in the blacksmith shop. And on a day, on a 94 degree day, the temperature affects the metal, the humidity affects everything. And yeah, I find myself constantly adjusting. Like I just made a beautiful piece. I went to go get a sip of coffee. And by the time I come back, it's out of adjustment and I have to readjust. So uh, I guess that's the flip side of the slop, the slop factor is that, yeah, you're constantly readjusting. And if we look at you know, the corpus of, of known coins that were produced at this mint, they weren't really cared too much about uh, quality control. You know? As, um, that being said though, you, with repetition comes mastery. And you know, by the time we're producing or they're producing uh, you know, things like the Noe One, the Noe 8, you're getting some pretty good looking consistent coins, you know, but I can tell you, you know, I haven't used this machine in a few months until I started prepping for this workshop. I hadn't used it since May and it sits in that box in my office and going back to it, it was ready to go, but I had to get my curve back. You know, I had to, you know, reacquire some skills that just kind of went dormant because I hadn't used them for a couple of months. But if I spent a week doing this day in and day out, like I did when I was first trying to get the machine to operate, I got pretty good at it. I wasn't uh, getting stuff like that, you know? So it's a very organic system, you know? And I, I have to say, I'm impressed with, with how well it works. And to me, it explains uh, a lot of, you know, what we see. Let's see how much more time we have. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, and this was by pure accident. If you look over here, where's a good example of it? If you look at the top of this die, you'll see some oopsies over there. Can you make out those, those beaded oopsies? That's actual die clash. Yeah. Uh, another question. Sure. Do you have a sense of how many coins could be produced with a set of dies? infinite um if you look at die progressions in certain die states uh you know certain die varieties like you know the noe oak tree 13 obverse die uh that morphs into the 14 just through continual recutting and i've even looked at things like you know the noe 3 pine tree shilling they're repairing that die you know they've had they have ways of filling clash dies um, you see die spalling where cracks in the metal open up, they get wider, they sort of spread into, uh, you know, the engraved uh, numerals and letters and stuff like that. And I think they lasted a pretty good long time because, you know, this is a very gentle way of, of producing coins. You know, it, it doesn't have that constant percussive crash, which will exploit in a much quicker fashion all the natural flaws in the metal. So um, I, I would say probably a, a die had a life of at least thousands of coins. You know, we have no idea what the total output was, but if we look at some of the numbers in Lou Jordan's book, uh, you know, from the, the surviving records of the Mint, yeah, the, the production was significant. Does that make sense, Chris? Yes, sir. You're looking at me like you're not sure. How long does it take you to prepare a set of dies? I'll tell you this, uh, took my blacksmith buddy about 10 minutes to forge that. Um, I could 
I could dress a die face from a rough forging down into a, a strikeable surface in probably, if I'm being fussy, a half an hour. And how long would it take me to cut those designs from scratch? Mm, between my first coffee and my third coffee, a few hours. And I'm not a fast or good engraver. And um, you know, when you're using these sorts of gravers, you spend almost more time sharpening the tool than you do actually doing the cutting. So uh, it does not take much. So the idea of, oh my God, this is a precious die. We must keep it in service as long as possible. It doesn't exist because they had blacksmiths, they had the ability, especially as you know, America's first silversmiths to be able to, to cut these designs in a matter of hours. So you know, there's, there's not a heck of a lot of anything other than everyday skills that would have been possessed by these men as silversmiths. You know, there's, there's no real mystery to it. It's not like uh, Jean Vieille Duval, you know, their secret process, but there's none of that stuff here. This is, this is, you know, coin, you know, the most simple mechanized way of coin making, you know, after the hand striking. So, and I think that to me was a little surprising. I think I kind of wanted it to be a little bit more complicated than, you know, what the evidence this experiment has suggested. Yeah. The other aspect of that would be how long did it take him to create the machine? Uh, the machine? Well, we don't know for sure if they even created their machine. Well, we don't have their machine, but, uh, you know, Hall and Sanderson were British born. I think Hull arrives in the 1630s. And I think Sanderson arrives in the 1640s as trained silversmiths. They could have had rollers they just brought with them. Uh, that being said, uh, our journeyman blacksmith made this. He's a very skilled uh, guy named Chris Hankels. His signature is right here on the plate. But um, it's not a very difficult thing to do. It's fussy because, you know, you want, you know, the gears, all four gears to be identical. Every tooth on every gear is identical to every other tooth on every other gear. And um, it's, it's not that difficult. It's, it's not like forging um, a clock mechanism or a clock jack, basically an 18th century kitchen rotisserie. Um, that's way more complicated than this. It's just so surprisingly simple. And that's the beauty of it, you know? So um, what else have I come up with? Uh, edge characteristics. Um, who spent a lot of time looking at the way these coins look from the edge. I know Tony has. There's some neat stuff going on. You know, um, the way the field of the coin, the blank field of the coin meets the edge of the planche, it is different than the way a letter, a raised letter meets the edge of the coin. It causes these subtle undulations that you can see. And this reproduces them beautifully. And in fact, when you come up here, I, I will ask everybody, pay attention to what the edge looks like. Um, where's a really shining example? I don't know if we can see this on the camera. These are the undulations I'm talking about between my thumbnails here. Those are all caused by where these letters run off the edge of the planchet, and also where the fields run off the edge of the planchet. Um, Mass silver is famous for edge splits. I would describe that to two things. Uh, you take a snip. If you have one tiny little cut going into the, the area of your planchet from the edge, when it goes through this machine, it's going to open up. Uh, if there is a flaw in the planchet, and again, like uh, the, uh, you know, the taller Noe 5 pine tree shilling that I showed had a terrific planchet flaw at six o'clock. They wouldn't have cared. Numismatists might care, but uh, whatever that flaw looked like before it was struck, it was in the planchet previous uh, to being run through the machine. So you get uh, that aspect, and uh, there's no doubt you get that 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock stretching. And you know what's really kind of neat, though? Um, I remember people talking about, oh, well, did they, uh, they obviously laid out the dies oval. No, 
If you're laying out an oval design on a die, you don't need a centering punch. You would need two centers to lay out an oval, if you remember your 10th grade geometry. So even though you know I'm laying out a perfect circle as scribed, it's not a flat plane, and you have metal that's stretching because of the pressure of the machine from top to bottom. So that's why we get these tall ovals. At the same time, you also, uh, with this machine, say the same, uh, you see the same problems where it tends to get weak in exactly the opposite direction. So from the three o'clock position to the nine o'clock position, there's almost always weakness in these strikes, which is also something you see in the real coins. But again, you know, hey, I can still make out the word Williamsburg, so it works. So pretty much everything that I've seen studying the real coins, and we've got 88 different pieces of mass silver at Colonial Williamsburg, thanks to somebody in this room whose name I won't mention, Tony. Um, uh, you, you can, you know, I've gone through the collection. I've looked for pieces that have extreme flaws or curious quirks. And uh, I've tried to replicate them, and I've been able to do all of it. Um, I also come up with an, another idea, you know, why so many of these pieces are bent. Have you ever tried to pick up a perfectly flat, large planchet shilling? They're tough to pick up. I think sometimes these were bent just to make them more tactile. It could be something that simple. I don't think it's got anything to do with witches. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody believes that. I don't know. I don't. Um, I've also noticed that at times I've gotten things off of this machine that are unacceptably curved or cupped. And what I would do is I put them on the workbench, which is made of oak, and I have a nice wooden mallet and I just give it a whack. And, you know, even if it's curved and I give it a, a whack, it kind of falls into a, a rough S curve. So I wonder if they were doing that too. So um, it's been a fun experiment. If any of you are in Williamsburg and would like to try your hand at this, uh, set up an appointment with me and we'll fire it up. I mean, uh, you know, Sid Martin was one of the first people to actually use this machine because he came down with, uh, with Leo and Ray and Roger. And, you know, we had a lot of fun with this, you know, and, uh, if there are suggestions for other experiments germane to uh, promoting the understanding of 17th century Massachusetts silver, uh, I'd like to hear them. You know, what else can we do with this? And yes, I've overstruck Lincoln pennies, and I made one on a Washington quarter, which I got from my grandfather as a little kid I wear around my neck. Um, and I guess the last thing I can say about uh, the experiment is I kept one on my keychain for the last few years. I want to see how they wear. So come up and take a look at this and see what you think. And sure. Um, what about the real small tubes? Did they run it through the same machine? And would the die, how would that work? Is it? I think the same way, except smaller. On a smaller scale, uh, obviously you're going. Yep, yeah. it would work through this machine. Um, uh, you obviously need probably much less pressure because you're not trying to evenly pressurize. You know the the breadth of the shilling. You know it's a much smaller diameter, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were using tweezers to actually feed the planches, because those things are peewees, and they still had centering problems on those too. So. Right? Bent through a larger bench, the two bents, and then trimmed it afterwards. Um, <clears throat> fully trimmed? I would say no, because, and, and it's partly because I've done it with these, you know, um, because I can cheat if I'm making a bunch of these to give to people. Um, I'll strike them this way, and as time allows, I will cut them. And you've got a problem, because there's always going to be a burr. And that burr is razor sharp. You don't see burrs on MS63 pine tree shillings. So they were obviously deburred previous to being cut out. So I would say, nope, no, nope, they, were, they were cut out and then struck. And they, they can be adjusted, you know, with a nip here or there. But uh, for the because of the sides, not the shillings. I think they were 
cutting them out. You want to know something? An apprentice has a small hand. <laughs> yeah, give it to the kids. And you know what? That's the perfect thing for, you know, uh, let's say maybe our, our friend uh, Jeremiah Dummer, you know, the second generation uh, silversmith who, you know, the first American born silversmith who, who cut the, uh, uh, the paper money plates for the 1690 Massachusetts issue. Um, he could have spent a good portion of his apprenticeship under, uh, under John Hall cutting out little peewees. Wish I knew for sure. Oh. Uh, a regular but roughly rolled coin and uh, how can you tell the difference between a regular but roughly rolled coin and one with a clipped planchet? That's kind of a tough one because they're all on clipped planchets. Um, whether or not they were clipped pre-striking, uh, pre-pressing, post-pressing to be adjusted for weight or by somebody say in the 18th century who's illicitly looking to acquire silver snippings. I don't know if you can tell. And, you know, uh, if you look at uh, like the PCGS standard, I think what anything below 62 grains they call clipped. So that means a 63 grain pine tree shilling is full weight. I don't think so. But at the same time, you know, most of them kind of weigh 68 to 72. There are some pieces that weigh close to 80 grains. You know, so there's there's a wide range. So I think, you know, our uh, idea of, well, you know, splitting hairs and tenths of a grain, I, I, they didn't have that kind of precision. They had balances. Um, so uh, I think when you had cut out thousands of planchets over the course of a number of years, you could look at that sheet metal and go, yep, yeah, that's the heavier stuff. I need an oval that's one inch by one and an eighth inch and, or whatever, and you could eyeball it. So um, I just think there's a lot of latitude. So when it, when it was clipped, I don't, I don't know if you can actually uh, accurately say, you know? Uh, one more question. Is that a non-answer? That was a perfect answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any evidence of the Saugus Ironworks being involved in the dye source of the steel? I don't see why there would be. Saugus Ironworks was doing cast iron, uh, you know, locally smelted and produced cast iron. Cast iron is great for things like firebacks, uh, cast iron cooking pots. That's a long way from steel. Because cast iron, you know, your first run of iron is basically useless for anything other than iron pigs for export back to Britain, shipment somewhere around the world. Uh, rough cast iron, first run cast iron has to then be refined, and then it has to be turned into steel. So I, I have not looked into Saugus, but I don't know if there was a need for the industrial production of steel in Massachusetts in the 1650s through 70s. So I, to me, it seems like a dubious assumption because, you know, uh, as modern Americans, we want to think of, you know, oh, iron is iron. Well, you know, a forge is not a furnace, two vastly different things in the period. So uh, it should be looked into. There's no doubt Saugus was producing things that were being purchased and used by the colonists in Massachusetts Bay, but making the assumption that, you know, the wrought iron came from them, I, I don't know, you know, it potentially might be provable with XRF and a, a large enough uh, sample from, from Saugus. So again, another non-answer. Sorry. Thank you, Eric. That's a wonderful demonstration. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Miss Betsy will be here all weekend, so I don't want to take a minute Yep. I would just ask that you don't play with the machine without me there. Yes. Because I want to avoid clashing these dies. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like your fingers to go home intact, too. Yeah. <laughs>